How cool was that? That was just amazing, wasn't it? So we'll just give Richard a minute whilst he unbuckles. I'm available if you need my help there, Richard. Just saying. So, um, okay, so, hey, welcome. That was very cool. Thank you very much. Amazing. That was good. Yeah, pleased with that. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. And Richard, you know, I had every confidence in you that you would land where we had rehearsed, but... Yes. Yes, I could see a little oh, nervousness I there. I know, I know. <laughs> but, but congratulations thank and you very thank much. you. Thank so, you. Richard, it's now over to you. Take it away. Lovely. I'll give you the clicker. Thank you very much. Yeah, it turns out you don't always need steps to get onto the stage. Uh, I'm going to share with you uh, a little bit of the. I made a oh, oh, I think we're all right with that. I oh. I made an error. Oh. Just give me one second. Yes. Guys, you're going to have an ability to ask questions to Richard. Um, but uh, so if you want to submit a question, as you can see here, and you've done this through, um, through the event so far, to submit a question, I need you to open the app. Uh, you've been using it all week. Navigate to the keynote session and join the discussion. So if you put your questions in there, and then we will ask Richard after he's gone through his talk, sorry about that, with the, all the excitement, I forgot the flow. <laughs> okay. And then um, we'll, we'll come back. So Richard? Lovely. Thank you very Over much. Over to you now. There That's you go. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, yes, so I'm going to share with you a little bit of the background behind what you've just seen. Uh, it's always helpful to have arrived like that because then that does kind of give some hint as to what the theme of the talk is around. Uh, and uh, it, uh, we've got a, a little bit of an insight into where we're taking this as well. So it really started out with, uh, looking back on it, I wasn't really aware of it at the time, but a lot of inspiration from my childhood. So. I used to spend a fair bit of time with my, uh, with my late father actually flying model gliders, so chucking a mostly balsa wood and uh, actually it wasn't quite as bad as the original tissue paper paste kind of versions that you might, some of you might remember, but nearly that bad and very, very simple two-channel little glider. Uh, and I guess that left a, a deep impression on me. There was something serene about watching those things just glide around uh, under your control. Um, Later in life, I, I spent actually quite a bit of time in the city of London. I was actually a, an oil trader with one of the oil majors for about 16 years, bizarrely enough. I could have spent, spent a fun time trying to get people to guess what my background was, and that wouldn't entirely have shed any light on it. Uh, alongside that, I actually spent about six years in the British Royal Marines Reserve, and that taught me an awful lot about human capability. I know there's a lot of talk about human capability, but there is something quite stark uh, about when you trained to do something that you couldn't have imagined you've done before, whether it's going for a 5K park run or rowing the Atlantic and everything in between. Uh, actually, it's quite amazing what you can train the human mind and body to do. So I've got a little clip of my old training partner here. Uh, I used to be able to get close to doing that. I'm too old now to do that. But um, that, I always think, if you had to show one picture of just how amazing the human machine can be from a balance and strength point of view, it's called a planche. His feet, I mean, one foot looks like it's touching the platform, but it's not. That's a, that's a ridiculous thing. That shouldn't work. And so, sort of inspired by that uh, and, and all the training with the Marines, I thought, you know, for no other reason other than the fun of it, what if you tried to have a run at flight. Uh, we're very good at building helicopters and aeroplanes that people sit in uh, with seats, sensible seats and, and sticks or yokes. But what if you just went entirely back to a completely basic starting point and decided to try and, as far as possible, use the human frame as the flight structure and the brain as the balancing machine? As I say, I want to reinforce this. I had no reason for doing this other than the pure joy of the unusual challenge. So. I realized that if the brain and the body are going to be critical to this, we are missing one thing. I mean, I'm not quite mad enough to think I can flap my way to the solution here. So you are going to have to add some form of power or propulsion to this. So back in 2016, around March 2016, I started playing around with what I thought might be the answer. And you've certainly heard uh, what, what it is I had settled on. Uh, they're micro gas turbines. They are little baby versions of what you have on the aircraft that many of you probably flew here on to get here. Uh, there's a few technical differences for those enthusiasts. There are centrifugal compressors rather than straight through, uh, but it means that they're very, very compact and light. So each one of the engines on my arm there, they only weigh 1.9 kilos, but they put out 22 kilos of thrust. I mean, that's notionally around 170 horsepower of each of the little engines, and I've got four, and one that's twice that big on my back, so it's about 1,050 horsepower in theory. 
Uh, so, well, hence all the god-awful noise it just makes. Um, so I started playing around with these ones. And this is a very, very old clip uh, in, in our life cycle of this journey. And this is back in 2016. So I am standing there in a lane in Wiltshire in the UK. I have got a very basic aluminium tube with an engine bolted to the top of it. And I am just starting to learn probably what was the most valuable lessons, at least in the first stages of this journey, which was that conventional wisdom of 120,000 RPM spinning spindle would have an amazing gyroscopic momentum. It would fight you in every way you push it. It would rip your arm off. It would flail like a garden hose. All of those things are rubbish. I've even stood on stages in front of academics who've refused to believe that I can actually manipulate and point that because they assume that it should have horrendous kind of talk. Uh, but it doesn't. And I wasn't entirely sure I was right, but you know what? If you just get out there and get your hands dirty, making sure that you've covered off the worst case scenario of what could go wrong here, and I think we did, uh, this was a very basic test. Uh, and the, I should point out the red bucket is actually where we had the fuel. It was in a container. I didn't have the fuel just sloshing in the bucket. So it's one small step better than that. But genuinely, that was just a phenomenal experience. It was just this spongy push. And if you think about the physics of it, instead of um, fire ho you know, a fire hose with water coming out of it at, let's say, I don't know, about 80 miles an hour, this is a gas turbine, which is really just blowing air at about 1,000 miles an hour. So the momentum, the force, is pretty much similar. It does feel, if you close your eyes and ignore the, ignore the, the warmth and, the, and the, the noise, it feels like a spongy hose. So I thought, this, is, this has got some potential. So instead of just one, what if, um, what if we got two? And I've upgraded the mop bucket now, so you know, ditch that. This gives you some idea. So I'm now trying to resist about 50 kilos of push, and it is phenomenal. That was a big lesson. If you try and push with 50 kilos of, of force, that's really hard. As soon as you put it underneath you, unless you less, weigh less than 50 kilos, then actually that, that disappears. Uh, but it was, quite, it was quite interesting that uh, it, it was very manageable once it was underneath you. The fact I was able to jump around and I wasn't flailing all over the place was really quite heartening. I thought, you know, this is, this is a, a pure extrapolation here. All I need to go and do is just keep adding more horsepower. So, well, guess what? We, I've shown you one, I've shown you two, so guess where we're going next? This is one of my favorite stages, because actually that was really quite fun. And you, I, I knew on paper I didn't have enough thrust to go, keep going up every time I jumped, but it was like being on the moon. You could jump and float about. And actually, it felt like your arms are really quite well suited to sort of automatically adjusting. If I fall to one side, what do I naturally do? I put my arm out. Well, if there's thrust coming out, it works even better. So that worked very well. This didn't work very well. This is using a tether, because it was a little bit annoying falling on that farmyard every now and then. So we tried to use a tether. The problem is that created effectively a fifth vector, which was even more troublesome when, as you can see now, I have put a, an engine on each leg as well. The logic being, your legs are designed to be load-bearing. They do that very well. Uh, the only thing is that the thrust is all underneath your weight, so it's, it's quite kind of top-heavy. The thrust also hits the ground. I get asked about putting leg engines on all the time, so I'll cover it. Um, the thrust hits the ground and tends to dig a hole in the concrete, even, even concrete, believe me, gradually, which isn't really ideal. Uh, it seriously limits where you could give. If I had it here, we'd have uh, worse than the slightly um, kind of prickly patches on the carpet here. Um, but the biggest problem, as you'll see from Eclipse in a minute, is that as soon as you feel that thrust come in, your, your legs feel like they've lost contact, or your feet feel like they've lost contact with the ground. And so you do this weird human reaction, which can be exhibited by holding a dog above a paddling pool, which is this pedaling motion. Humans do the same thing. You can find countless, countless pictures of humans jumping off bridges and pedaling. I found that I ended up doing the same thing, uh, and that really wasn't helpful when there's 22 kilos of thrust coming out of each leg, effectively. Anyway, before we really went into too much detail with the legs, we went back to the arms and thought, well, if we just go up and put more engines on, then surely that's enough. Um, it, it kind of on paper was enough to fly, but it was a silly idea. This whole journey was about having an often quite crazy idea, quickly analyzing what would be the worst that could happen if it went wrong, as long as that wasn't permanent damage to us anybody else, uh, and didn't cost us too much to the point where we couldn't keep the journey going, we just got on and tried. And it's a common theme, as I say, that we've, we've kind of perpetuated for the last four years or so. Uh, th so this, this little model here, this is a bit like the one with the tether, but without the tether, so it was actually better. I'm trying to iteratively train my brain to feel what it's like and trust the idea of thrust under my legs. 
Uh, and the only way to do it was just sort of weirdly bunny hop around. Still not enough power to get off the ground, but it was, you know, learning. There's no manual for this, unsurprisingly. Uh, and you can see I was very pleased with myself at the end of this because uh, I hadn't fallen over, which was usually the outcome of a, of a morning trying to do this at a weekend. There we go. I was very, very pleased with myself. So the, the, the arrangement that we ended up with, as I've sort of given away, is, is the very helpful two engines on each arm. The net result feels like it's going up your arm. And then adding the last little bit of horsepower and putting it on your legs. But look at my feet. Look. Oh, that. It's very odd. I, I, you, it's like patting your head and rubbing your stomach. It, you're constantly thinking, or if anybody's played around flying a helicopter or can fly a helicopter and remember when you couldn't, it's the same thing. There's an awful lot of things going on, and it was quite hard work. However, only some eight months after that, standing in a lane with a mop bucket, um, I'm going to show you the clip of where this went from something I really didn't tell very many people about to something that I thought, gosh, this might actually have some potential to go further than the little Wiltshire farmyard we were using. So in November 2016, this is what we managed to do. I'm still fighting that leg. But there you go. That was an actual coherent six-second flight uh, using your body and your brain and a bunch of little jet engines to actually fly. So since then, and I've got a little collection of clips which highlight some of, I mean, it's even out of date now, but some of the uh, places we've been. This is uh, nearly our hundredth time we've flown this at a, an event, and this is our 30th country of doing so. And here's a little, a little indulgent uh, tour through some of them. So it's also worth pointing out that I sort of segued straight to a, the, mo the model, the design that's sitting right there, which is what happened with the leg engines was that we really got fed up with them for all the reasons I've described. So they gradually migrated up to my posterior, uh, which was better. Uh, the only sort of subtlety was that those little arm engines uh, don't like starting unless they're horizontal because no fool starts a jet engine vertically. Uh, we did. Uh, so I found myself with the very, very first sort of six months of events after we launched in 2017 actually trying to do sort of launches by just sort of uh, during the startup quietly hiding to one side and any sort of cover I could find twerking my way as flat as I could to try and get the damn things to start. I remember doing that for the one show of all things um, for the BBC which was um, embarrassing. Anyway, we've then consolidated those two little engines into one larger one and actually that is happier starting vertically and it's got a bit of excess power to lift even more fuel. But fundamentally it's still pretty much the same system. I'll come back to some subtleties in a bit. Uh, might come as a surprise but we actually have built a really successful business, if I may say, out of this, uh, which is still a surprise to me because we did start with that ethos of just having some fun. Uh, we, apart from doing events, we actually train people to fly, and we've done this with probably three dozen people now, and we uh, tether them up in that kind of way. It does look like we're about to execute somebody, but that's not the case. Uh, and you essentially, that's a complicated old version, but now all we have is a uh, belay system uh, that tethers you so you can't go lower than about that. We don't give you enough power to go up for any sustained period of time, you just drift down again. And then in your own time, you just learn to uh, manipulate the thrust vectors. Sounds hard to describe. It's about as hard to describe as explaining how you learn to ride a bike. Really hard to describe, you just have to feel it. Here's a little clip though of one of our clients that only took, I think, five goes. Each go is about 90 seconds. And this is his, let's say, fifth or sixth go. Look at his silly grin as well, here we go. So you see him vectoring down. And then he flares out, arrests the climb, and you can see him without even thinking. Look, he's just thinking about grinning. You could see all that, that vectoring control is starting to become really intuitive. Uh, and we sold uh, a couple as well, but we're terrible, cust we're terrible uh, retailers. We then sell it to you and then keep it and look after it, a bit like a sort of high-end Ferrari, because I don't really want to find one disappearing off into the side of a building somewhere. Um, we've also, because of my Marines background, and it's really a good excuse to show you some quite fun clips, we've also been having a lot of fun proving the uh, use of this in a lot of interesting environments, particularly getting soldiers on and off or in and out of places, especially in a water environment, because humans are pretty rubbish at walking on water, so we get about as close as you can get to that. And this is, this is a lot of fun we had with the Royal Navy uh, with one of their patrol boats. Um, the smaller the boat, the harder it is, so we picked the smallest two boats they had. Um, I've flown on the aircraft carrier, which um, you'll see in a minute, but actually that's like a big football pitch, it's not very difficult. This was more fun, and I told the patrol boat, slightly worryingly, to try and lose me. Um, so you see it constantly turning away from me and trying to avoid me. 
Um, I thought that was a good idea, but then I have to say, the clip in a second, when I turned around and I thought, oh, it would be fun to go and do a straight past, it is surprising how when that boat's doing 25, 30 knots and I'm doing 40, 50 miles an hour, how quickly, and we've edited it because it goes on for a while, as I turn around and go, oh, that's a very small boat and that's where I live. So uh, it took me a while to get back to it. But this is nice here where you can see, even though that boat is moving, and it was a bit blustery, see, I just really don't notice, and I've got six or seven pilots in my team that could do that now that didn't even bother taking the railings down. You can just sort of slide down and land. It's huge credit to how the human brain works, to be honest. Uh, and there's a couple more interesting little military ones as well. So it was suspected that there's no way I'd be able to fly near a hovering, hovering helicopter, let alone the Merlin, which is a big old beast. Um, turned out to be all right. Uh, and uh, scientifically less useful, but still quite a moment, was having uh, a Hercules and an A400 fly over the top of me. Uh, for the celebration of the RAF 100, which was quite fun. This little clip, I just gave it the game away slightly. We thought we'd throw it in because I, I just kind of, I don't know, we, we, we wondered if we'd do this. I'd love to see um, if people put up their hands, how many people have seen the following clip? And the reason I ask that is because it was on LinkedIn and did nearly 7 million views. Hands up who saw that, who's seen that clip. What, what a fun bit of science. That's not bad, is it, really? Who, who would have thought LinkedIn? Anyway, we just put that up there because uh, we thought it was a bit of fun for, from an event we did with the MOD when the Queen Elizabeth, the, the first of the two new aircraft carriers, was out visiting Washington. And uh, the embassy said, look, we've got a great idea. Get your beret out. Go and scare all the inbound dignitaries who are coming in on these little shuttle vessels for this big celebration of the QE. And so I said, well, okay, I don't need asking twice. So I spent the whole morning flying out un, sort of unannounced and going and uh, meeting all these people. I didn't quite realize they were the entire leadership of the US military. But anyway, that turned out to be quite, quite useful. That was a very unusual day flying off the back of an aircraft carrier. We've got a great clip as well, not enough time to show it, of actually lapping the whole thing as well. Unfortunately, what I didn't realize is when the, when the embassy said, yeah, green light, let's go and do it, all the dignitaries were supposed to be watching a pre-recorded pre film that Boris Johnson had done. Um, this is before the election that was supposed to be enthralling the mostly American audience with all his plans, and nobody heard any of it because some idiot was flying a jet suit past the hangar doors. Uh, anyway, we didn't know about that. So apart from playing around with the military, uh, something that's very close to our heart is, I suppose, uh, the whole STEM agenda. I think it's really powerful, really important to uh, inspire the next generation as far as possible, given all the distractions they have. You know, I've, I've got an 11-year-old and a 13-year-old, and anything that gets them looking at something other than a screen is always, is always, I think, of value. So we have gone around the world, and every time we've done uh, events in places like China, the US, we've managed to go and uh, do, uh, you know, slot in somewhere a little school visit or a school flight, and so uh, there, there's been some quite notable ones there. I have to say, the one in the stadium, that was quite fun, flying in and then landing, and a bit like, a bit like this, actually. The kids went completely berserk. Uh, and if it's not enough just to do this, the, the kids who see this often make this very immediate and, and, you know, very flattering connection with a certain Marvel superhero, um, which from a marketing point of view, again, I'm not really complaining. Look, we don't, we don't, I could be clinking around in bits of red and gold plastic. That's for other people to make that connection. Uh, but then you'll have to ignore what I just said because otherwise I can't really explain this. Powering up. <laughs> that is brilliant. It's not red and yeah, gold anyway, amazing. but. So do you think that you can fly in this? No well, idea. I reckon I can. No. Right. Well, let's get to it. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Iron Man! Notice how you can't see my eyes? I couldn't see out. I had no idea. They, somebody just really needed to tap me on the head to tell me when to go. It was fun. Notice all the looking down trying to get some idea of where the ground was. <laughs> so, whilst this is just playing out, uh, I'll explain. You can just turn the volume down a tiny bit, thank you. Um, actually, it was a really interesting project. Adam Savage, who many of you I'm sure are aware of from Mythbusters, and I met him at the original TED I spoke at. 
uh, he had this ludicrous idea, let's, let's sweet talk the original director of Iron Man to hand over the CAD files that they used in the film. There are CAD files, I guess they must have built the costumes for, from them. And uh, let's go and print in titanium the entire suit. Then let's shoot at it the next day, not luckily the day I was in it, um, but the next day, let's shoot at it and see if we can prove it's bulletproof. And it, and it was, I mean, there's fragments going everywhere. Uh, I, like I say, I wasn't, wasn't in it, but it was, it, was, it was wonderful. And actually, on this point, you know, as a slightly miserable Brit at heart, um, I thought the whole world of Comic-Con and science fiction and stuff, you know, I just thought, you know, I, I didn't really get it, I suppose. Uh, I, and, you know, as a kid, I suppose, I was some, to some extent in, into it, but not very much. Uh, having flown one of these suits at Comic-Con, it suddenly dawned on me, if you have to find a realm in the world where there is unbounded human creativity that cares little about money or physics, and just is driven entirely by, wow, that would be cool, that's science fiction. And think how many things we've got in the world that have ended up actually being you know, evolved or thought up or in that realm. You know, flip, flip out mobile phones is the sort of obvious example. So I've got a sort of newfound respect that actually, yes, okay, this is a bit of fun. But actually, it sort of in inspires people to, to, to imagine, wouldn't it be cool to fly like that? And it wasn't my starting point. But anyway, I, I think the, the whole comic book, comic con thing is really fascinating. I want to just touch on as well, I'm aware there's a lot of pretty technical people in the crowd. So there is, there is an element to this which I'm really quite proud of from a technical point of view. That whole suit now is 3D printed, and I say whole, you know, 80% of it. The entire backpack, I mean, you're seeing the bit that's against me, the bit round the other side, maybe the camera can see if it can creep round the back. Um, you can see just round the, yeah, round the back a bit. Um, that is all printed in nylon, and it's using a big laser sintering system. There is aluminium, or, uh, that's aluminium 3D printing, uh, the top and bottom of the engines to hold the engines in, and some of the blade-off protection. The sort of dirtier bit of, of metal printing at the bottom there is um, uh, steel 3D printing as well. It's such a wonderful technique because it allows you to have an idea, get somebody to draw it in three-dimensional space on a CAD system, and literally press print if you've designed it with some sympathy to the process, and this is how it works. You are literally drawing layer by layer that design. So those are actually the clamshells. If you imagine some of the old clamshells um, that are holding the engines in, those were the curves of the clamshells. I can't think what the hell that is, but anyway. Yeah, it's hard to work it out when it's layered. But all that happens is the, the laser draws one layer, and then it's from original sort of screen printing technology. It layers another very fine bed of powder over the top, and the laser does another thing, gluing that layer to the previous one. 12, 20 hours later, whatever it is, knock the powder out, and there is your miraculous piece of equipment. It's pretty rubbish if you want to build any more than five or six at any one time. Um, certainly for 100,000, that'd be a pretty painful way of doing it. But for us, we change our mind on every single suit we build. We, we can immediately think of ways of improving it. So of the five or six suits we've got um, running at the moment, there's a sort of family tree of the oldest, cruddiest one to the latest, fanciest one. And we sort of decommission the old one, having gone and printed a new one. It is an amazing fuel for, I suppose, R&D. Um, if I then pause for a moment and think, so we've gone and built this flying system. It's a little bit like um, a Harrier or an F-35 from the point of view of the thrust vectoring. They're, they're blowing air downwards and lifting you up. Those are how the, that's how those two aircraft work. But what do those two aircraft do when they've done that? Well, they tend to point those nozzles backwards and then gradually accelerate and end up turning into an aircraft, generating lift from wings, aerodynamic lift, rather than generating lift by blowing air downwards. It's a very hard way to fly, to be honest. Well, we thought, wouldn't that be kind of quite fun? Why can't we do that? So we went back to the drawing board. This is probably 18 months ago. And I'm going to share with you the sort of back to the drawing board clips again. We haven't lost that spirit, despite all the fancy printing. We haven't lost the uh, spirit of, look, have an idea. Identify quickly what's within your grasp to be able to try it and test it. Is anybody going to die? No. And then get on and try it. And so this is a piece of plywood strapped to my legs, because I had this idea that you could potentially lift your legs flatter and flatter. All the very crude assemblies we tried in this instance really didn't work. You can see that hitting the thrust of the rear engine. So we went to super sophisticated plywood upper body wing and went for a fly around the countryside. So this, this, you can see the angle of attack is terrible, but it was, it was a, a, again, a sort of ground zero moment of like, how, how, what is this like to fly with? And a point of note, you can see the thrust vexes really quite nicely in the grass there. That was fun. You, you've got no visual indication of what I felt, but it felt like somebody was gradually lifting me more than I was vectoring. And I left this piece in because you can see how ridiculously stable and controlled it is, even with that on there. It really didn't impede the slow speed maneuverability, which was nice. 
So t testing, you know, we, we like to think we can test a lot of things pretty safely. You pick a squidgy piece of ground and don't go too fast or high. Uh, but there's another slightly more unusual way of testing, which is, is, is rather than buying air tunnel time, and we've been very kind, we lent some air tunnel, tunnel time before, it's an awful lot more efficient to go and turn the whole of the Wiltshire countryside into your own, air, uh, in your own uh, wind tunnel. So uh, pick a volunteer. It's a terrible wing, that. It was a massively thick section. But the idea was to start feeling in relatively clean air by going backwards, start feeling whether that wing was starting to do much. It was, it was quite fun, and I never knew that horrible machine could go that fast backwards. Uh, we also built a 50% scale hang glider wing. Same volunteer. Uh, that, that, I had great high hopes for that, and it just didn't work. It just didn't generate enough lift in the way we were looking at it when it was huge huge span and you just got a tiny bit of turbulence on one tip and it just felt like it was going to own your, uh, your control, whereas we always want to be feeling like we're in primary control. Cutting a whole load of clips out of lots of fails and, and all sorts of mad things we tried, the BBC approached us a little while ago, I think it was the back end of last year, and said um, there was a, a mad German scientist who tried to send post mail letters to the Isle of Wight, a um, little island south of the UK, it's only a couple of miles offshore, and I think the first test, the rocket went up and blew up and showered the audience with letters. And the second one, I think, went, got caught by the wind, went back into a town and, like, I don't know, in the 1850s, killed a couple of people. So I was thinking, why did they phone me? Anyway, they wished that we, I suppose, third time lucky, would actually go in as part of their documentary, recreate the attempt to get mail quickly to the island. So we thought, well, that just sounds like a testing day to us. So we did. We picked um, the latest leg wing, which we've been developing. It's very simple. Jet suit, um, sorry, jet suit, wing suit type wing, ram air pockets so it inflates as you lift, and our latest attempt at a, at a wing iteration. It's kind of almost rather embarrassing watching this because I never get that flat with it, so that barely defines as a wing, to be honest. But it was a really interesting test, and it really didn't take very long. I think, as you'll see in the clip in a second, I think I was loitering around 60 miles an hour, certainly outrunning that supposedly very quick boat. Uh, that stalk on my head is the same as that one there. That's a 360 camera, which creates the most amazing kind of panoramic views, having removed the image of its own stalk, thereby confusing everybody online. Uh, but it's a brilliant way of, of uh, capturing some content. This is a nice little FPV shot. So you can see, I mean, my body is getting flatter, so the rear engine is now employed to a degree to thrust me forward. Uh, and my arms, though, are still really employed to keep me in the air. Um, the, the vision is to gradually sweep those arms backwards and further and further back, generating more and more lift aerodynamically. Uh, and you can see, coming to land, so uh, interestingly, as you come into land, you actually have to turn the power back up to kind of thrust vector, hold your weight, and then land. If you forget to do that, you don't land like that. Um, that used to be our best clip, and then around, uh, gosh, I should know the dates, but it's been busy. Back end again of last year, the Guinness World Records folks said, look, you set your speed record at 32 miles an hour. It's a very easy record to grasp because no one had ever done it before. So guess what? We set it. Uh, that was 32 miles an hour. Oh, I think it must have been two and a half years ago or so. So we said, well, I'm sure we can have a run at that. And again, let's use that as an excuse to test our latest uh, wing systems. So this was, and I'm in the middle with the orange leg wing. I, I thought it'd be fun to do with two of my team, sort of see me off, as it were. Um, you can see the guy on the left went very close to a wave. That was exciting. Uh, so as I then progress forward, it's an amazing experience. You, you can just you, you open your legs. <laughs> uh, the two pockets scoop air. The wing then expands. You feel that lift your legs. You can feel this acceleration as the rear engine goes more and more horizontal. Sweep your arms to a degree back and then feel like you're really cooking. And then panic and try and find the boat. Because uh, you do cover quite some ground. So that's 85 miles an hour, 135 kilometers an hour. We're only scraping the surface because those arms, as you notice, they're still mostly lifting me. So we've actually got a really nice little stubby, very aggressively swept, very aggressive uh, dihedral wing, which is going to just, I think, pep up the amount of natural lift my upper body's creating uh, to really allow my arms to be free. And then we really are going to have to nudge that power down, which is great because then you can go lot further because you're not burning so much fuel or choose to go insanely fast, which we're not going to do. 
Before we go any quicker than 85 miles an hour, we've actually got a load of work. I might even be testing it tomorrow back in the UK. We've got various different parachute systems, but they're designed to arrest forward speed rather than go really high. We don't go really high just because there's nothing up there just apart from risk. Um, so I'm, I'm personally really excited about where we can go with this VTOL transition thing because it hugely pushes open the range window. I mean, the suit at the moment, it, when, you, you know, when I was just hovering there, gradually damaging the carpet, uh, I'm burning around four liters a minute to do that. So I'm carrying usually 20 liters or so. When I'm in the cruise, I'm running already now. I can, I can sit there at easily 50, 60 miles an hour quite comfortably, burning 25%, 30% less fuel because I'm now flying more like an aircraft. So if we further enhance that principle, we can, I think, get a, a really interesting range extension. And uh, which, when you really think about it, if I started off by saying Harriers and F-35s, how they, you know, and how they fly, it's the same thing. They, I think the Harrier, when the British Air Force and the Navy had the Harrier, I think they could only hover for like 90 seconds or even less. They've since boosted the power. In fact, the Spanish ones actually, I think, have got a lot greater endurance in the hover. But fundamentally, they're very limited. And yet, when they transition back into aircraft mode, they can go for an awful lot longer. So, technically, I think that's really kind of fun. Now. It, it's pushing the, the safety aspect, so not only are we working on this parachute system, but also a whole bunch of buoyancy systems. We've, we, we always fly over water with a water-triggered life jacket, and we've built into the latest suits a whole bunch of voids that are filled with foam. So that suit, if you threw that suit in, in a big tub of water or in a, in a swimming pool, apart from me being a bit sad, um, it would actually just bob around fairly neutrally. So it's not actually dragging you under the water. And then the life jacket's an additional aid. But I like the idea of even removing the possible risk of that uh, water-triggered life jacket from failing and actually having a solid foam kind of, I don't know, Tutankhamun headdress type assembly, which will also smooth the airflow and stabilize your neck and give you that permanent buoyancy. So all of these things, are, we're beavering away in the background. We're not traveling, trying to perfect, because I think we might look back in 18 months, two years' time and think we really were in such a rudimentary, almost farmyard phase again, even what we, with what we do now. So where is all this going? If I mentioned that we do events, which has been a great short-term kind of, uh, you know, great way of sharing what we do, uh, all of that packs into two check-in suitcases. We've got a third suitcase with some spares, and you just go on anywhere in the world with it, and that's hence the 30 countries. Uh, that's been a huge, you know, a huge value. We train clients as well to fly, and uh, we have sold a couple, but as I say, with a lot of caveats. Well, actually, when you really take a step back, and having seen the reaction of people, and you're you, you'll be the better judge than me saying this, but it's usually quite, a, quite an unusual experience to see a human move around in that kind of way. Why not supersize it? Why not go and actually gather a whole bunch of our pilots from different backgrounds? They often tend to be gymnasts or, um, you know, uh, uh, there's a couple of stuntmen folks. There, there's all sorts of people, former pilots as well. We can train most people, but those backgrounds tend to be very quick then why don't you assemble those people, actually pick a water course, because then you don't have to go and worry too much about you know, the potential of failures, because as you can guess, I mean, I'm not gonna glide wearing that if I get an engine failure. We might come back to failure a bit later. Um, then actually you need to be doing this over a surface that's kind of forgiving. So relatively low, life jacket, all that foam thing I'm talking about, and have a whole bunch of people in a Red Bull Air Race style actually racing each other. Because when you think about it, what does Formula One or IndyCar or NASCAR, what do they all do? I mean, what do those vehicles actually achieve? Well, you know, they're pretty useless for going to the shops in. If you actually think about it, it's entertainment. It's hopefully inspiration. They're pretty inspiring to see and hear those cars whipping past and seeing what they can perform. Um, but also, they leave a trail of really interesting technology. You know, the Kerr system, uh, regenerative braking and things like that. Well, why don't we have a little slice of that? So the clip I'm going to show you uh, is a little teaser for something that's coming even as soon as the next six weeks' time. This, this, is, this is a pretty crude little teaser, but gives you some idea. Why not actually go racing these things four or five of you at a time around a pylon course uh, and really use that as a mechanism, not only to accelerate the entertainment side, but really accelerate the R&D side? Because as soon as I say, you know, mine's faster than yours, that's where you get the really big gain. So um, I'll share with this, this with you. It starts right now. Let's see what happens. Here he comes, here he comes. 
absolutely crazy if he can make this move. That is a very neat move indeed. He's still a little bit under pressure. So they are giving it everything here. Is he going to go inside or outside? There's a terrific scrap here. At the moment, side by side. That is absolutely epic. Wow. We're on to the final lap of the race. Who's going to get it? Hangs onto the inside line, and they make contact. has totally destroyed his race and some jet engines <laughs> so that that little that little voice you heard trailing off at the end there thank you very much <laughs> That little voice you heard trailing off at the end, you know, that wasn't made up. That was one of my team that genuinely meant that. There's almost a point where, actually, if we keep generating revenue in other areas, we're going to do that anyway, because that is the most exciting thing me or the other three pilots have ever done in our lives. And believe me, that one is a GB team gymnast, one's a professional stuntman, uh, the other one has done a lot of unusual sports in his time. It was just so fun. I don't know what it is about humans. As soon, you know, if you're flying around in whatever it is or driving around by yourself, as soon, that's one thing. As soon as there's somebody else and you think, oh, I want to get in front of them, I don't know what happens. But it was just so much fun. And because the way this system works, and you just have to take my word for it, it it's weirdly like a bicycle. Since when did you think, when you're on a bicycle, well, I must make sure I maintain my center of gravity right over the center of mass of the bicycle, and I'm going to use my micro-adjustment to the handlebars in order to achieve that. You don't think of any of that. Your subconscious, a long time ago, volunteered just to cover that and just said, look, you just worry about looking at the view and tell me where you want to go. In exactly the same way, the human brain adapts, and, and the, the record we've had so far is, uh, is, actually, we've had several people do this now, is less than five minutes. It's actually slightly over three minutes of training to be able to actually hover, still on the tether, but you can just see the moment. They look up and grin like you saw the, uh, the chap on the clip. So if you, if you take that and then imagine what it's like once that's, that's really embedded in, when you're actually flying, your consciousness is just over here. I've, I've heard fighter pilots describe the same thing. They are not thinking about what their hands and their feet are doing. They're there, are right out here, thinking about where they, as part of the machine, want to be. This is the, the ultimate intimate connection between mind, body, and machine. You just feel like you can fly. I, I've done uh, a busy filming day before for a, for a commercial, and I did, I think, about 12 flights. And it really amused me that right at the end, there was, a, there was like a, a little river, canal kind of thing, the other, with my car parked the other side, and we'd been filming the other side of it. And I'd finished filming, and I still had the suit on, and uh, I, I think, what did I do? I think I went to go and unclip it, I was just chatting to somebody, and they said, right, okay, let's go back to the car. And I just went, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it was, without even thinking about it, my brain had started to go, hang on, normal is just, ah. And, and it was really, really weird. Uh, it's amazing how, I guess, like when you're on a boat, you, you start to um, get used to the rocking. When you go on dry land, you, you feel like it's moving. It was the same way. It's amazing how, how you start to adapt and that become normal. So with racing, I can only begin to imagine what it's going to be like when we have a whole bunch of people vastly more capable than me. Most of my pilots are half my age uh, and very much more willing to uh, push it a lot more than I, I, I do. I think it's just going to get fascinating. And again, if you think about the forward applicability of this, the first motor cars were considered um, you know, noisy, smelly, and useless. There's that lovely story of um, uh, the, orig the, the original pioneer from Mercedes-Benz. I think it was... I think it was Mercedes-Benz, um, who took the very rudimentary prototype car and decided, well, screw it, I'm going to go and try and drive 10 miles across to the next village. And it took like a, three days as it kept on breaking down. And everybody laughed at it, because compared to the incumbent technology, a horse, it was a joke. Well, I'm not going to get hung up as to whether everybody's going to be flying around in jet suits. I think, as you can gather by that, it's not exactly practical. Thank God everybody hasn't traveled around like that at the moment. But actually, in terms of leaving that trail of interesting insight and, and, and learnings and technology, then, you know, who knows?
But at the moment, as I say, the focus is really trying to drive home that really, I hope, entertaining and inspirational uh, kind of manifestation of, of humans and machines in the form of the race series. And I, I want to uh, share a last clip that is a little bit more uh, glamorous than the one uh, is the New Forest Water Park near, uh, near where we are in Wiltshire, uh, which is where we were flying there. If you marry up the image of the comp competitive element with the scenery in the next clip, which is Bermuda, which is where our race is going to be. Uh, we, the press release, strange coincidence, is going out right today, 21st of March. Uh, we are going to have four or five pilots racing around a water course um, in the main har harbour in Hamilton, and it's going to look spectacular. And this is a little insight to, to what it's going to look like. This is from the TED talk, the last TED talk I did there in Bermuda, and it was a um, beautiful location, distinctly warmer water to fall into. And it was playing with one of the prototype wings as well. So you see the little ram air pockets as well, quite nicely there. And those fins on my legs, they have made all the difference. They're like a tail plane tail strakes, if you like. They help uh, in the same way that the feathers on the back of an arrow keep the arrow going in a straight line. The yaw, yaw instability was terrible before then. That, just for the first time ever, I've been able to actually aerodynamically bank, which is the most ludicrous feeling. Just need to get a faster boat. So I think you might agree that's come on quite a long way from the mop bucket and falling over in a farmyard. So uh, thank you very much. Well, Richard, or should I say Iron Man, that's just incredible, really amazing. Thank you. And, you know, from all of the clips that you've shown, just how things have progressed, which is, which is amazing. But... You know, have things ever gone wrong? So I, I, I mentioned at the beginning, I've mentioned several times, sort of teased this, that I genuinely mean this from my time in a big corporation, 16 years I was in BP, uh, I recognize that there is a strange tussle between risk and innovation. You mm. have to take some risk to innovate. The critical thing we've learned is that you just analyze what's the worst that can happen if the risk manifests. I used to run a trading book. If you didn't get that right, you'd wouldn't be invited to stay there very long. Mm -hmm. So if you manage that downside risk success successfully, where from a reputation, safety, and financial point of view, you can keep getting back up again and trying again, that's how you progress. Mm -hmm. So that's our sort of guardian rule set. Um, but that does mean things do go wrong. It's just we, we, go, we get good at picking ourselves up. So it just so happens, we don't share this with everybody. We've got a nice little collection of what failure in our world actually means. So do you want to see that? Absolutely. You want to see that? Okay, here we go. <laughs> yeah. Don't clap yet. You haven't seen what's coming. <laughs> that was the original Guinness World Records. A lot of these, there's nothing wrong with the equipment. It was learning, let's put it that way. Nothing wrong with the equipment. He just got panicked when he saw a flag. Compressor oh. stall. Compressor stall for tech engine nerds out there. I knew the failure was coming there. That was very sad. I couldn't get to the beach in time. It's disappointing. This was a big one. Look at that. Whee. Imagine those in the race series, though. And you can see the life jacket within a second come straight out. It's used in the oil industry and everything. This was in the Maldives. Very annoying. They contaminated my fuel with uh, fabric conditioner. Uh, this clip and this one are examples of when you bank an aircraft, you have to turn on the power to change your momentum. And two of my colleagues learned that a very damp way. So you've seen one of these fails. This is the one you didn't see when we were filming the race series. And then you did see this one, but let's just enjoy it again when he goes in head first. <laughs> Nothing wrong with the equipment here. He just jumped too early. Note to self, if you do a superhero la launch, don't jump too early. And uh, yeah. Ooh. That looked a lot worse than it was. I'm 
just very glad somebody put that large, squadgy ramp just right in the right place. So look, you know, it's impossible to make everything in life perfectly safe, but we are absolute guardians of trying to minimize that risk, because otherwise we just stop the journey. We can't get back up again and keep going, so. Fantastic. Well, should we see what questions we've got from yes. the audience? Okay. How do you feel when you fly? Yeah, I do get this a lot. So it's very hard to describe it, but it, but it, it is like that dream that you sometimes have, especially you have when you're a kid. It's definitely not as noisy as that when you dream about flying, but you do feel that strange, you know, like you're able to jump and just float and you have complete three-dimensional freedom. I, I think as humans, we always look at the birds and think that must be quite cool. And without really thinking about it too much, we, we just grow up knowing that that's the rule. We don't own that bit, right? We always come back down here. Uh, for two to three minutes a time, that rule goes out the window. Mm -hmm. You are entirely free. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is very hard to describe, but it is pretty phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly I want to have a go at this. I'm sure yeah. a lot of folks here <laughs> would like to get one of those suits. Okay, next one. Is this being uh, used yeah. for first responders or SAR? Yeah, search and rescue. So that's, that's really interesting. So we have a lot of search and rescue folks that are reaching out to us. In the spirit of trying it and seeing what we learn, we're absolutely down with it. And there's a scenario where you imagine there's somebody lost on a, on a rugged mountainside in the Lake District. Mm. They know they're somewhere on that mountainside. They can't just search the whole time with a helicopter because you can't see or hear, and you, know, you can't get close to the mm. potential area. You drive a Land Rover within 3K, say, and there's a big river in spate. We'll just pull the jet suit out of the Land Rover, strap it on, and skim two meters over that surface and scan up and down, find the casualty, land, shut down, yeah. triage assessment, get on the radio, say, right, we need the drone support. You know, this is the scenario we want to film. Uh, bring in the heavy lift drone. We've got several partners that have got suitable equipment for this. But you do the human bit, which is stabilizing, talking to the casualty, mm. warning them there's going to be an interesting experience coming. It'll be clearly a dummy, first of all. Mm. Um, roll, you know, get, get them secured on the stretcher, then bring in the drone and connect them, get them away. But the drone's also brought your spare fuel in, and then you can fly back again. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there are easier ways of potentially uh, recovering a casualty, but I think we can learn something from it, and it would be really interesting. So yes, in answer to that question. Okay. Next one. Wow, where will this suit be in 10 years? How long have you been working on this now? Yeah, so it's 2016, is, is all that falling over in a farmyard, so really not very long in the scheme of things. So how much can years. I can't, 10 years is a long time. Yeah, I just, I can't even imagine in one year's time. Mm. Things like that wing development, I mean, I'm sure many of you in the room are involved in R&D, and you know, sometimes you have high hopes for a, for a little development, you think that's surely gonna be a real step change. They never do, I mean, they never work, do they? It's the little outlier where you think, well, we'll give it a go, but it probably would be no use. And suddenly, those leg strokes, I was just, it was a different thing to fly. Mm -hmm. Every time we got up in the airflow, it felt like it was sliding sideways. It was a very disconcerting feeling. Put those leg strokes on, it was just, it was like being your own little jet fighter. Mm -hmm. So it only takes those little breakthroughs and we're in an entirely different world. So yeah. I'd like to see the race series as a touring kind of regular thing. That I think is, you know, the effect it has on kids and young people especially. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know about 10 years, but even a year, it should be a very different, exciting place. Okay, wonderful. And I have one last question for you here. So you used to work in the corporate world, as you mentioned uh, earlier, and you know, you would come to environments and events like this and see people doing different and unique things. Oh, so, annoying, yeah. so once we're very jealous of what you <laughs> do, but we have to go back to work on Monday. Yes. And we want to take some of, the, some of the lessons and the things that you've shared. Um, so what would your guidance be? Yeah, so I, 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 mean this, I mean this from the heart, because I remember going to quite a few corporate events, and you'd sit there listening to somebody in their 20s having just rode the Atlantic and think, well, that's lovely. <laughs> I'd love to just take a break from the mortgage and go and have a go at that. And then you get back to the desk on the Monday, and you think, well, I, you know, I really haven't learned much from that person. They probably don't know the, the challenges of operating within the corporate environment, where you've got to, yes, be innovative, but you've also got to keep delivering against a huge structure of you know, compliance and everything. So there's a little story from my previous life where I kind of think, in hindsight, I applied the same, kind of, the, 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 the same spirit of trying to identify something exciting, trying to get off the drawing board really quickly, not just making it a you know, scheduled meeting for next quarter, but actually, what can I go and get my hands around today that will let me test and explore it? And what is the downside of every single one of these steps? Am I going to get fired, mostly? That's the most important thing. Um, and, and then just keep, keep applying that, that process. So what happened, and it was about 10 years ago, so I'm at liberty to talk about it now. I had this 
fortuitous meeting when I was in a very junior position in the oil trading world where somebody had mentioned that from a health and safety point of view, you could spot where ships were, you could replay their behavior, their, like their, their locations, um, from the point of view of vetting whether they could go and berth at a, at a port again, right? So every time it goes there, you've got to vet in, whatever. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Well, how does that work? It turned out they all have these little transponders. These transponders, if you're a ship and I'm a ship, we ping each other our free-to-air location, and then in the dark, dead of night, our, our system, rather than relying just on radar, can actually go, ah, thanks for your GPS location. I know where you are, and I know where you're going, and I can help try and avoid you. Mm -hmm. No one had realized that's really useful from a commercial point of view, because it had all grown up in the health and safety world, so to cut a long story short, I borrowed $20,000, borrowed, properly borrowed, but um, they, my boss at the time didn't really know what I was doing with it, but I did borrow it. <laughs> uh, built a very simple Google Maps kind of look-alike, um, which just had dots on a map. And, uh, and this was with an external company. Managed to host it, I couldn't, oh, this is your world, isn't it? I wasn't allowed to host it anywhere near the trading four nines, five nines, you know, uh, reliability arena. Uh, so some lovely good sport in South Africa who was looking after our intranet server said, yeah, oh, whatever, stick it on there. Uh, I got the URL literally printed out, this dates it now, printed out on bits of paper and put it all over the trading floor and then went home. Next morning, there was this huge hubbub with people with bits of paper all over the place and all the screens I could see had this cruddy little map with all these dots on it, and uh, it, it just was huge. We could actually predict, because they were typing in, where all the trade flows were going. Mm. So it was, it was huge. I mean, it, if you go on any commodity trading floor today, you'll see people using that AIS-based data. Mm. Uh, we didn't invent it, I just had the temerity to go and follow a hunch, still covering that downside, mm. um, not, get, not doing anything that would get me fired, but just going and being you know, curious, and then ending up with something that was tangible, not, not a paper that would say, well, it might be an idea, but no one's going to look at it. Mm -hmm. So wherever possible, I guess, if you can apply those same uh, rules, you know, be curious, be excitable, but also just keep covering the downside and go off and explore. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if that's useful, then I don't know, but that arguably had more impact than any jet suit business that I might have built. Well, well listen, fun. Richard, a huge thank you. You're an inspiration to us all with this fast thank failure, you. high innovate, and you know, uh, an amazing experiment that you've been doing that you'll continue <laughs> you. with for some time. Thank you very much. Thank you.